Oh God, we thank you that the words we have just sung to you are true. God, how you never fail us. The great love you have for us. How you want to draw us even closer to you moment by moment of each day. Truly, you are a good God. We give you praise and glory. Amen. I'd like you to turn your Bibles this morning. Uh, I had invited Donna to read scripture this morning, but I gave the wrong passage. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, the passage is Galatians 3, verse 28. Would you be willing to read that still, Donna, this morning? Galatians 3, 28, and uh, I can even just bring the mic to you here. Galatians 3, 28. <laughs> Galatians 3, 28. I'm reading from the NESB. Let me find there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Donna. Nice, short, and sweet verse to read this morning, but uh, it will be the least peeing board that we use as we look at what God wants to say to us this morning. Let's go to God in prayer again and invite him to speak to us this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time now we have to read and study your word. We ask, Lord God, as we study these words, Lord, that you speak to us. Lord, as you speak to us, Lord, we pray that you open our eyes to see you, open our ears to hear from you, and give us the courage to put into practice what you teach us this morning. For these things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. You're a racist. You ever heard that phrase said? Probably if you've been around and haven't been under a rock for the last five to ten years, you've probably heard someone make that accusation of another person. And it may not even have to do with race at all. Um, I'm reminded of a story uh, of even in a church where a person got upset because they sung about how God cleanses us and makes us white as snow. And that person said, that song's racist because it says white as snow. <laughs> um, no, that's not racist. The word white is not racist. Being white isn't racist, just like being black isn't racist or um brown or yellow or any other color or even different cultures. Um, it's one of those things that our culture and some people in our culture have misappropriated in a way to a point where that term racist doesn't really mean much of anything anymore other than an insult that's thrown at anyone who disagrees with them. Um, but it's important to look at what does God's word say about the subject of racism and slavery? Recently, in the last two weeks, I'd seen a debate between a Christian and an atheist. And this debate, they're debating of, does the Bible condone slavery? Does it condone racism? And it's interesting to hear that conversation between this Christian and an atheist, because the atheist was completely out of whack, and the Christian actually didn't really give a good explanation of what God's Word says about this issue. This morning, we continue our series on issues of the day. And again, looking at the issue of racism and slavery. Does the Bible teach that slavery is okay? Well, we'll answer that question this morning. And also the question of, can a Christian be racist? We'll answer that question this morning as well, too. We need to understand what God says in his word about this subject. So then we'll know how to act rightly in regards to how we treat other people that are different of us, people of a different color of skin or different nationality. I want to give this understanding, though, of racism to racism isn't just between whites and other colors. It actually happens within the same color, too, but it's still a different bloodline of people. 
Mandela of a country in Africa. I can't remember the name of the country, but there's two groups there called the Hutsis and the Tutsis. And they were often fighting each other while one group was fighting the other. Um, and it's because the one group hated the other. Same color of skin, different nationality still, and they're racist against each other. If you look at the world history, we see this as the case too. England often had battles and wars with France or with Germany or the three of them fighting each other. And it's all because they hate each other because of their culture and because of their nationality, their bloodlines. Seems kind of silly something to fight over, isn't it? Bloodlines. So here's what we look at this morning. First point this morning is this, is that God created one race. God created one race. Racism and race is actually not a biblical concept. Because God created all of humanity, God created one people. There may be different pigmentations of skin and different bloodlines, but it all actually comes back again to Adam and Eve, doesn't it? As we've seen in genealogies from God's word, we know that all of humanity comes back to, traced to be to Adam and Eve. And because of that, we can understand, and the verse we'll look at in just a moment here, Job 7, 17, that God created one race, the human race. Does it matter our color of skin? Does it matter which culture we come from? God created us all together as one race. Job 7, 17 says, What is man that you make so much of him and that you set your heart on him? When Job spoke these words, when he used the word man here, it's all inclusive of all of mankind. That's the thing we need to understand too. When we look at God's word, when it says man, we need to look at the context. Is it talking about an individual person or all of humanity? Because there's many times in scripture that man is used in plural in regarding to all of mankind, all of humanity, men, women, and children. And in this case here, when Job saw, says this, and he uses this word man, he's referring to all of humanity. What is man? that you make so much of him and that you set your heart on him? Great question for Job to ask, isn't it? And the simple answer of this is because God created us for relationship with him. That's why God created one race. Not because one person's better than another, but because God loved everyone he has created. That's why he's died, he died on the cross for our sins. Further to that, Job 12, verse 10. In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. <clears throat> Again, that last phrase, the breath of all mankind. That is in God's hand too. So God created one race. And as one people, we are called to a few things. A, we're called to love one another. Matthew 22, verse 39 to 40 says this, And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The command that Jesus gave just before this commandment was to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then Jesus tells his disciples too that we're, the second commandment is also important. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, this neighbor has been dissected a lot, and I've heard many sermons talking about this very thing of neighbor, and even I've preached some sermons on this too, that this neighbor isn't necessarily the person next door to you, although that is your neighbor, but Jesus referring to neighbor here is everyone. Everyone is your neighbor. You are to love everyone that God puts in your path. Even the person that gets under your skin. Is it easy to love a person that gets under our skin? No. Sometimes those people are in the same household as us sometimes, isn't there? But nonetheless, we are called to love each other. Regardless of whether they're family or not whether they're friend or not, 
whether they're even, if they're our enemy, if they're trying to do harm to us. We are to love one another. Then B, as one people, we are called to be equally under Christ. We are equally under Christ. Matthew 10, 24 says, A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. In essence, what Jesus is saying in these words here, because we're not above, his, above Christ, we are then equal because we are the same foothold, the same setting as, as each other. None of us are above Christ. So we are equal before Christ then. Elsewhere, as we'll see in a moment too, God's word tells us too that we're equals in Christ. So we must remember that God created one race, the human race. We are to love one another. And we're equally under Christ. That actually leads us to the second point. We're going to look deeper. I'd be here with looking at the second point. That the human race are created as equals. The verse that Donna read for us this morning, Galatians 3.28 says here again, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. It's important that Paul wrote these words to remind us that we're equals under Christ. You notice how Paul uses these words here? He makes a comparison between Jews and Greeks, saying that there is neither Jew nor Greek before Christ. We can actually replace that work with Greek to Gentile, because that would actually include everyone more so, and just not just the Greeks. But because Paul was writing to the churches in Galatia, that was primarily Greek people. And a lot of Jews didn't like the Greeks because the Greeks had enslaved them. They were under the rule and authority of the Greeks. So under Christ, there is no Jew or Greek. There's also neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for we are all again, all one in Christ. As I mentioned, I saw this debate between this Christian and an atheist dis discussing whether the Bible condones slavery. And I heard actually another person discuss that re this past week on YouTube. It's another person talking about slavery in the Bible and, and how the Bible seems to condone slavery. But if we study God's word properly, we will come to the understanding that God's word does not, does not allow for slavery. It does not say that slavery is okay. It does mention about how there was slavery and there's many things in God's word that, that God records history of, of things, but doesn't necessarily mean that God condones those things. And we see that a lot of times in the Old Testament. There are things that happen that God did not approve of. But we record that, that people did these things. And the truth is here of slavery. God's word does not condone slavery. In fact, it tells us that slavery is wrong. How? Well, we'll look at that further in a moment here. The term slave is actually a very broad term because we didn't have terms like employee and employment back in the day when God's word was written. In fact, the word employee didn't come until the 1400s and is from French background. So because we didn't have that word, we had this one word slavery or slave to define a whole cross section of type of people. And in God's word, especially in the New Testament, the Greek word for slave here is doulos. And here's the definition of doulos. Male slave as an entity in a social economic context. Let me read that again. Male slave as an entity in a social economic context. What does that sound like? Sounds like a worker, right? Sounds like an employee. 
right? The second definition for this word is one who is solely committed to another. What does that sound like? Still sounds like an employee, doesn't it? Because if the employee is working for a boss, they should be committed to that boss, right? Doing the work faithfully for that boss because they're being paid to do a job. The semantic range though, of this word is used with three main words throughout the New Testament. One is servant, another is slave, and the third is bond servant. There's a sense of lo loyalty to those they work for, but is in a state of employment. They may even be part of the household and live on the premises, but the focus of this word is, in essence, employee. And whenever God's word uses this in context, it's used of employment. Now, does God's word in the New Testament talk about slavery? Yes, it does, because it does talk about how even the Jews were, in, some, in essence, slaves to the Greek people because they were under the rulership of the Greeks. But even the Greeks had a strong sense of freedom. In one of, uh, one of my study books I use called A Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, the author writes this about this term, doulos, and even how the Greeks viewed slavery. Greeks have a strong sense of freedom. Personal dignity consists of freedom. There is thus a violent aversion to bondage. Service may be rendered to the state, but by free choice. Slavery is scorned and rejected. This explains the fierceness with which the Greeks fought for political independence. The only slavery Plato will allow is to the laws. The laws, however, represent the goal of humanity, so that slavery to law is in no way derogatory. Aristotle shows a similar scorn for slavery. For him, slaves have no part in the state or true service to it. That same book looks at the Jewish idea of it too and says, when one falls subject to another, dulunian is the proper word to describe it. This word dulunian is not used as frequently as doulos is. So again, the picture in the New Testament isn't that of slavery, but that of service for employment. Now, it may mean, too, that they may be indebted to a person for a long period of time. We see this in Jewish culture, too, in the Old Testament, too, that it speaks of those who are Jews could sell themselves to others in their nation as servants for a period of six years, and in the seventh year, they would go free again. There's the year of Jubilee. Uh, sorry, ju your Jubilee, Jubilee was every 50 years, but every seven years still, there's a returning of the land back to everyone so everyone had their own land again. It was like wiping the street clear of debts. So even for the Jews, slavery wasn't the same idea. It wasn't the same idea of when they were in Egypt. There was the kind of slavery that God's word does not accept. Just that God was recording that it took place. Again, those slaves, though, in the New Testament, slaves then are also fully integrated into the community. If they had the chance of freedom, though they were to take it, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7.21. But in any case, they come with all believers under the common law of love, which in the long run, if applied, necessarily means the end of slavery among Christians. One might think, though, well, what about Philemon? Didn't Paul write to Philemon and tell him, here's your slave back in the Onesimus? But if you read the book of Philemon, you'd also recognize what Jesus or what Paul was saying to Philemon. To treat him as a brother. To treat him with kindness. And Paul was even willing to pay for Onesimus' freedom. So it's not slavery in the sense of forced labor, of brutal conditions not being treated rightly, or even of racism but one uh, who works in employment to another. 
In fact, God's word actually condemns this idea of slavery. 1 Timothy 1, verse 10, actually beginning verse 8 through 11. There's a specific term here that we'll see in a moment that shows us that God's word condemns slavery. As we understand, as North Americans understand because of the slave trade back hundreds of years ago. 1 Timothy 1. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understand this, that the law is not laid down for, for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy, profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. In verse 10, there's that one verse or word that I paused on. Did that with intentionality. The word enslavers. This word enslavers, the Greek word for it, I'm not going to pronounce it because I'm going to get it wrong. But the Greek word for enslavers here means one who acquires persons for use by others. Slave dealer. Kidnapper. When we think of slavery often in our North American context, a lot of people's mind goes back to the slave trade that happened in the Americas, where some people in Africa were gathered, they're kidnapped, and then they're sent across the sea to the U.S. and used as, as slaves, and sometimes brutally. Not all of them. I understand as I started a little bit more about history that there are some people who own slaves who treat them pretty well, actually. The majority of them were not treated well, though. Some were treated really, really badly. It's this thing that God's Word is speaking of. Those who buy and sell people for the purpose of enslaving them. Now, recently, I watched a movie. You may have heard this movie. It's called The Sound of Freedom. I'm not going to go too much into it, but because the content of this movie is so awful. Uh, after I watched it, I told Sherry I'd watched it, and I said, I don't think you can watch this one because then I, I, once is enough for me. <laughs> it's almost too much because, in essence, it's the slave trade of children in this movie and the evils of that. When we think of kidnapper, we often think of someone who's kidnapped, who have picked up a kid and stolen them away from their family. But the broader context of that term kidnapper is anyone who steals another person and enslaves them, uses them for their own personal benefit without care or thought to that person, treating them less than a person. It's these kind of people that God is speaking of that is wrong. So God's word does not condone slavery. It actually speaks and prohibits it. And in this list of vices, of people um, who, who, who are in essence not Christians, those who are facing damnation if they don't repent of these sins, these enslavers, these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. They must repent of it. So in the past, when we hear of Christians who had owned slaves in the past, first of all, we need to ask the question of, were they actually slaves or were they employees? But then the second question is, if they were actual slaves, was that person actually a Christian then? We have this group, these groups in this world today, um, Aryan Nation, some of them are called, or Ku Klux Klan too. Some of them even claim to be Christians. But I tell you, because the hate they have for other people, that is not true. They could not be Christians. Because as we see here, A, next slide. Again, we're to love one another. We're not to enslave people and treat them less than a person, to treat them like an animal, but to treat them with love. We've read this passage already, but we'll read it again here again. Matthew 22, verse 39 and 40. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Only on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. We are to love one another. We are not to look at other people as less than us. In fact, God's Word tells us 
that we're supposed to see them as either as equals or better than us even. So look at others when you look at them. Don't see the color of their skin. Don't see them as less than you. But see them as God sees them. As someone God created and loves dearly. We are called to love. Final slide. My brothers and sisters, we're called to love others. We are not to treat people wrongly or badly because they're different than us. And different by being different nationalities and colors. We're to treat, again, people with love. Because God created one race, the human race. And God has created us all as equals under Him. Yes, we may have different roles and different responsibilities. That's another talk for another time. Another sermon for another time. But God, under His law, created us as equals. We all equally need God. We all equally need forgiveness of his, of our sins. We all equally need God to renew us. In essence, God is colorblind. Not literally, because we don't have colors if God was truly colorblind. But when it comes to race, God is colorblind. Because God created all people for relationship with Him. Likewise, then, too, we are to be colorblind as well. Remember a song by a Christian band years ago, a Christian rap artist called DC Talk. It had this very line in it, colorblind. We are called to be colorblind, to love everyone, just as Christ loves us. So my brothers and sisters, do you want to honor God? Then treat people how God intended, with love. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're thankful to know that you have created one race, the human race. Even though you have, since Adam and Eve, you have made more diversity in color in all of humanity. Lord, it just shows again your creativity. And as a reminder from your word, you have lo loved every single person that you've created. So Lord God, may we be an example of you to others. To love every single person. Whether we like what they do or not, may we show your love because you are love. You're the perfect example of it, Lord God. Lord, may they see you in us. These things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. 